This is Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. Jackie Heinrich is a three-time Emmy Award-winning reporter. She's currently a White House correspondent for Fox News, and she's the first Fox News reporter we've ever hosted on Politics and Media 101. At a time when President Biden is juggling different crises at home and abroad, we talked to her about what she's hearing from within the White House as a Fox News reporter, about whether it's hard for her to make friends and cultivate sources in a Democratic White House working for Fox News. We also got her thoughts about the future of the network and on streaming media overall. As a quick reminder, all of our events are taped 100% live. Anyone who wants to can join to ask our guests a question. We welcome voices from across the political spectrum. The one rule is to keep it civil. For information on how to join us, past episodes, and to sign up for our best of newsletter, please visit our website, pm101.live. Our next episode this Friday will feature Josh Barrow, host of The Very Serious Podcast, former senior editor of Business Insider. If you like what you hear, please take a second to hit subscribe and make sure you don't miss it. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. I'm wondering, you speak with this White House probably on a daily basis, press briefings, background briefings. Have the tone that they use and the way that they talk about one another changed markedly over the last month in the midst of this lead balloon of polling? You know, I'm going to give you an answer that you probably didn't expect, which is no, it hasn't changed. I think that this you know, Press Shop especially does a remarkable job of holding the messaging together, whether or not that means that you're getting an honest answer about, you know, the true state of things. They really are effective um, when it comes to making sure that they're on message and shutting down any sort of speculation that Javier Becerra, you know, that, that they're looking for a replacement for him. Saki talked about it in the briefing yesterday, you know, saying the president has you know full faith in, in Javier Becerra. Um, when these kinds of stories come out, they shoot them down. I think the most notable example of that was when there was a lot of negative media around uh, the vice president's office. There had been a series of staff departures, and you saw Simone Sanders and Jen Psaki forcefully come out and start to sort of shut down a lot of that reporting and be more vocal about it. Now, I do have to mention there that was against the backdrop of some other reporting to suggest that there hadn't been a vocal enough defense of the vice president who had been dealt a lot of these sort of unwinnable issues like the border and, um, you know, was was never going to be able to win on that. There's a lot of division on Ukraine. Um, there's been a lot, there was a lot of division on Afghanistan. That was sort of the first moment where you saw, um, you know, leaks out of the administration, just sort of people speaking candidly and breaking with the sort of, you know, overall we're we're all one team. This is all good. You, you know, there was some pretty stark language in how they were describing their reaction to the um, withdrawal and how it was carried out. And I think that that's, you know, on foreign policy, that's sort of the issue where you get the most of that. The rest of the stuff when it comes to, you know, COVID, the border, uh, they're, they're pretty cohesive. You just hit on a couple foreign policy issues, Afghanistan, and we now have Ukraine, and you've been reporting on both of these issues. I'm wondering, from these foreign policy issues, which are crises, how does this White House handle a crisis? Well, um, I think that, you know, if you look at the president's polling, um, Afghanistan sunk his polling. He was above water uh, before the withdrawal. I think that, you know, the president had made a decision um, before he was even in office, that it was time to get out of Afghanistan. And that was a sentiment that a lot of people shared. The majority of the American people felt that it was time to get out of Afghanistan, but the way that, that it happened, um, it it was haphazard. You had those terrible images of, you know, Afghans falling from the wheel wells of a plane. I mean, these are just, that is a crisis. And so to have the president now at his year-end press conference, what was it, a couple weeks ago, say that he has no regrets about Afghanistan. I mean, that is um, a a little bit of a a black mark, I think, and something that they haven't figured out how to uh, move on from gracefully because people hear him say, I have no regrets, and they don't like that. Ukraine is a different issue. 
the U.S. is really working in partnership with its allies to figure out the best way forward, way way through this, if there is one. Um, it's a tough situation, and you know it's exposing a lot of issues that existed before President Biden was the president. You have you know a lot of European allies who are heavily dependent on Russian gas. Um, you have to then go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what, what kind of sanctions can we put together that wouldn't have a ripple effect into our economy? That then Putin can look at this and say, I can outlast that. I'm going to. I'm just going to keep on keeping on until you take your foot off the gas because you you want to throw the sanctions package at me. It's going to hurt you too. And that's sort of the calculus right now of what people are figuring out. And uh, his most recent demands that, you know, NATO shrink its membership down to 1997 levels. I mean, these are just things that are totally outlandish and non-starters for the diplomats who are handling this. But I do think that the, this White House has a lot of partnership um, and is, is working closely with its allies to figure out the best way forward. We have uh, an, an eye on the Olympics, because if you look historically, when he um, invaded or when he annexed Crimea in 2014, that was during the Olympics. When he invaded Georgia in 2008, that was during the Olympics. So that's sort of, you know, playing out over the course of the next few weeks. And it's definitely in the forefront of everybody's minds. A couple weeks ago, Republicans were loudly, pugilistically criticizing President Biden for his actions on Ukraine. And then Mitch McConnell, a week or two ago, came out saying he was encouraged with the direction the Biden administration is moving. So without getting into specific policy issues, with your discussion with these GOP sources, the politics aside, maybe even specific policy, is there any type of consensus on what the Biden administration is doing, whether it is the right approach? Well, no, there's no consensus among the GOP. And I think that that is a reflection of sort of the divisions within that party. Just as there are divisions in the Democratic Party, there are factions of the GOP. Um, you have people like you know, McConnell who are saying, look, we need to be sending anti-aircraft and anti-tank weaponry to Ukraine um, and getting ready to impose sanctions and being ready to pull that trigger if we need to before Russian troops set foot in Ukraine, because if we wait until after the fact, it's going to be a whole hell of a lot harder to get them out. And then you have, um, you know, a, a different faction of the Republican Party tending to be more aligned with the former president, Trump, uh, who say we shouldn't be worrying about you know, a foreign country's border when we need to be focusing on our own border. So that's an existing division uh, within the Republican Party about how they want to see the Biden administration approach Ukraine. As the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee in the 1990s, he was the lead author of a crime bill that followed after a decline in crime rates across the country. Well, now the White House is preparing for yet another summer spike in violence. And so the president laid out his strategy uh, to keep guns off the streets and to keep cops on the beat. This is a president who, during the course of the 2020 campaign, went against the grain of his party in opposing the defund the police movement. And part of his plan would allow states and local governments to use COVID relief money, that $1.9 trillion package from March, to hire and train additional law enforcement. The politics of this issue have only hardened since Biden was a senator. This shouldn't be a red or blue issue. It's an American issue. We're not changing the Constitution. We're enforcing it being reasonable. We're taking on the bad actors doing bad and dangerous things in our communities and to our country. In 2020, homicide rates rose 29 percent. And now in 2021, they're up additionally. There was just a conference of mayors and Republicans and Democrats alike are very concerned about crime. Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, said, we will not back down. And, and crime is a top issue. Do we have any understanding of why this rise in crime is happening? Well, um, there are two disparate views on this. There is the White House view, which is that uh, crime has been on the rise since the Trump administration. And there's some data to back that up, too. Um, and they also point to the pandemic as a driving factor in, you know, a, a lot of these rising statistics that we've been seeing. Um, 
The other perspective, which a lot of Republicans have, is that there's a, a sort of push within uh, not necessarily the White House, because this doesn't come from the White House, but it is from the Democratic Party, um, where you have prosecutors, district attorneys, they want fewer people to end up being incarcerated, right? Like we have, there's a problem. You've got so many people in jail, a lot of them for drug crimes and these kinds of things. And there's been a real push to rehabilitate um, criminals or people who are convicted of crimes rather than incarcerate them unduly and subject them to a system where then you could argue that their life is going to be worse because of that. They would have a worse chance of reintegrating into society. And part of that is playing out in you know New York. You have this new district attorney who over the course of the last month or so in Manhattan, um, he first came out and said, look, we're going to take a different approach. We're going to downgrade certain crimes. Um, we're, we're not going to prosecute other crimes. We want to take take a different approach and sort of, it's sort of the equivalent of like, do you call a social worker to a 911 call or do you have a police officer show up? It's that sort of same vein of thinking. And um, you have Republicans criticizing those choices, but those are the two views. Um, and I think for the White House, the challenge here is that President Biden has never been uh, one of those Democrats who wanted to defund police. He, throughout the campaign, throughout the transition, and even in this White House, you know, consistently voices his support for law enforcement. Um, and it is true that they, you know, proposed in their budget more money for the community policing program uh, than the prior administration. It is also true that in the American Rescue Plan, there was available funding that cities could use to hire more police. However, the American Rescue Plan was uh, done on a reconciliation basis. This was done, you know, party line without consultation with Republicans uh, on a lot of these issues. If they had put up a, a bill that was to fund police, I, I think you would have had a lot more Republican support. But this was an aid, a, a coronavirus aid package where then you could have cities that would opt to use that money for that purpose. And some did and some didn't. And, you know, look at the White House even has has criticized on a totally different issue on education. They've criticized some states and said, look, we made this money available to you. You should have improved the ventilation in your schools, et cetera, et cetera. Some used it wisely and some didn't. Is there any larger initiative being cooked up in the White House to go after guns? We know that background checks have 80 or 90, whatever percent, depending on the poll that you're looking at. Do they have any momentum with this crime wave to actually try and do something in Congress with guns? Oh, you know, I, I don't think so. It just has not been um, something that they've talked about as a, as a possibility. The president's initiatives when it comes to policing, for instance, like there was a big effort to try to get police reform through. That didn't work out, um, despite, you know, a, a pretty solid effort, I think, from a, a good bipartisan group. I think the sort of end result of that had a lot to do with the police unions uh, disagreeing on what the size and what the role of government should be and something like that. But I have not um, heard of any sort of legislative push from this White House on gun control. Um, it's it's just not something that has been sort of in the the mix of the, the rotating topics that they, they sort of try to push through. You know, you've got the spending plan, you've got voting rights, police reform, student debt, prescription drugs. Those are sort of the things that that keep resurfacing. We're going to ask a couple questions about Fox News and then the future with digital. And then we will go to the audience for questions. Jackie, your job is based on relationships, whether it be with the Republican Party, the current administration, which is Democrats. I wanted to get into very briefly the behavior of some of the primetime hosts at Fox News and specifically kind of whitewashing and calling January 6th the false flag operation and really minimizing it. Does that aspect of what's going on with some of your colleagues make your job of cultivating these relationships with Democrats, being in the White House press corps every single day, more difficult? Well, I appreciate the question. I, I think that the, the group of people that I'm working with, I mean, I covered the Biden campaign and they know me, they know my work. Um, and I've got good relationships with those people. I think also my, my body of reporting stands for itself. And I've been lucky to 
have a, a really good group of sources on both sides of the aisle and within the administration. Um, my job is to be a reporter. I'm on the news side of things. And there is daylight between what my job is and what the objective of the opinion hosts is. Uh, I will say, you know, every network has its opinion hosts. Every network has its reporters. It's Their jobs are entirely different. And, you know, w- we go to work and do the jobs that we set out to do. I personally have not had a difficult time cultivating relationships or, or doing my job because of uh, some of the perspectives that come out of the opinion side of, of the network. I think that everyone knows that our jobs are different. And as long as I can stand by my reporting, I'm going to have those sources. And as long as I'm doing my job the right way, I'm going to have those sources. And that's also what the new side encourages us to do, right? Like we have a huge responsibility uh, being in the news division, especially covering the White House for this network to do the news very well. And that's what I set out to do every day. Fox News appears to also be making a transition to digital away from maybe traditional cable. Where do you see you're inside the company? I know you're in the news. I know you're not an executive, but you have to hear these conversations going on. Um, Do you see Fox News in 10 years primarily being a digital brand or where do you see this transition going? Oh, gosh. I mean, I wish I had a crystal ball and could give you a a really great answer on that. I don't know, (laughs) to be honest with you. I think that everyone is sort of evaluating the landscape, right? I mean, you have your, what is it, 25 to 54 demo that everyone's interested in. That's the ratings group that people care about. How many of those people are watching live TV? How many are recording their favorite shows and watching it on, you know, their DVR? How many are watching their, getting their news from their phone or their tablet? And I think that everyone sort of knows that the future is going to be in streaming. Um, but Fox still has a huge cable news audience. I mean, it, it just does. This transition to digital, do you see this impacting your job and specifically the role of hard news reporters at Fox News? Will that be less in the future? Will it be more? How do you see digital impacting this? Well, I think... You could say this of any network. Um, The more partisan your opinion content is, the more important your news division is. Um, It's it's partly a reflection of like where the country is at this point in time. I mean, we've never been in a more partisan environment than we are right now. And, you know, you see that reflected in the content, whether it be on Fox or on CNN, MSNBC, on the opinion content, that is. Um, You know, you're people watch opinion shows to have their views underscored, right? That's why you watch an opinion show. Um, but also news should be the the lens through which you're viewing this. And I think that that makes our job so much more important so that people who, you know, are fired up about whatever issue it is that they care about, um, can also go to the network that they watch and get some perspective on it. Um, because, you know, your, your job is to be fair, is to be balanced, is to be accurate. And, you know, that's, that's what we're supposed to do every day. So I don't see that changing. Biden took a slightly different tone today, didn't want to answer any questions. And he calls our own Peter Ducey a stupid son of a stupid son. Of a- really? Mr. Unity strikes again. Uh, within about an hour of that exchange, he called my cell phone and uh, he said, it's nothing personal, pal. And I made sure to tell him that I'm always going to try to ask something different than what everybody else is asking. And uh, he said, you've got to. And that's a quote from the president. So I'll keep doing it. Neely, over to you. Thank you, Justin. Jackie, looking ahead, we have the State of the Union, I think, exactly in a month from today. Would love your perspective on that. You know, right now, it seems that President Biden has two choices. He can unite the nation and divide his party, or he could unite his party and divide the nation. Which one path do you think he might take? And if it, and it's 
hopefully optimistically around uniting the nation. How do you think he does it? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Neely. Um, I think that, you know, this sort of speaks to the, the challenge within this president, right? So he is a, a man who was in the Senate for 36 years, and he talks about, um, you know, the good old days where everything was bipartisan. And those are sort of the, the things that he comes back to when he is talking about how much faith he has in people to get things done. And you just have to, you know, he's a consensus seeker uh, as an individual. I do think that um, the Democratic Party has sort of has moved toward a a, a different perspective. And I, I won't say, you know, move to the left and they're 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 casting Republicans aside. I don't think that that's what it is. I think that what we're seeing is from the progressive faction of the party, um, a sense of urgency and thinking that, OK, we have this Democratic president in office right now and we can get a few things done that are really important and that will reshape the country in the way that we want to see happen if we can all stick together and do this along party lines. And so that's sort of the push pull that he is facing every day is, you know, do you side with the progressive wing of the party that wants to, you know, make some, in their view, very necessary updates to the fabric of the country, the social construct of the country, how how we live and take care of our kids and our elders and what have you? Or do you unite the country in a more traditional way, maybe like what Joe Manchin wants to see, and do everything through um, a bipartisan lens? I do think that, you know, there are a lot of Republicans who would like to partner with the president. I also think that there is a faction of the Republican Party that is hell bent on making sure he doesn't get anything done and being ob obstructive to that um, cause. So how he ends up achieving that, I don't know. But I do know that, you know, he's tried out sort of different um, strategies when it came to, for instance, the infrastructure law that you saw the first group of, of lawmakers, I believe the first group ever that he invited to the White House was a group of Republicans. I believe it was Republican senators. I think that was the first group of batch of folks he had in there to try to get something done on infrastructure, traditionally non-toxic issue that everyone can sort of align together, band together on. They've got, you know, you go back to your home district and say, I voted for an infrastructure plan. Look, uh, Joe voter, now you don't have to drive through a pothole every day on your way to work. Like this should be a win for anyone, no matter what party you're with. Governor Sununu of New Hampshire, who in my opinion would have been a shoe in for Senate uh, against Senator Maggie Hassan, if he decided to run, met with Mitch McConnell, and has been quoted, this Republican governor, saying, I don't go to D.C. after meeting with Mitch McConnell. McConnell told us until 2024, we're not going to pass anything. We're just going to be obstructionist. And I don't go to D.C. to do that. I'm going to work and I can do the best work here in New Hampshire because their GOP Senate is not going to allow anything through. So I think that that kind of outlines the difficulties facing the Biden administration with maybe sounding bipartisan and the hard reality that it's probably not that likely. So we will go to Dr. Dan. Over to you, Dr. Dan. Uh, thanks, Justin. Um, hey, Jackie, thank you for being here um, and your insight. Um, I'm going to flip the questions around a little bit. I want to look at the perspective, um, focusing on misinformation. How do we reshape or rebrand Fox specifically as an outlet when we have some wonderful journalists there and where we have maybe some may argue there are some areas where we're having some misinformation or where the fact checking and exact journalism is not being done um, and or at least it's not as clear. I know that it's a challenge on all sides, it doesn't matter. I think it's just the facts are the facts. How do we rebrand and make sure that that's the same thing that's coming from the perspective of a Fox News person who has experience in that area and what you see your generation and your being there as showing a light of um, how journalism and how that should be done? I just want to know what your perspective is and what we should be looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I think that one, you know, one thing that has sort of driven um, 
people's skepticism about the, the pandemic, right? And and how to best respond to it has been muddled messaging of late. Of, and I'm talking about like lately, because you did have a whole other issue where, you know, people didn't believe in the pandemic. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like lately, um, you had CDC messaging that was um, confusing for people. And Dr. Walensky recently came out and said, look, I think that one thing that we didn't do was we didn't tell people that the guidance might change. Because I think that when, you know, you have someone who maybe is, um, you know, not fully trusting of the idea of a, a mandated vaccination that that's sort of like doesn't jive with their worldview, they, their view of what the role of government should be, and then they have also coming from that same agency, you know, guidance that changes seemingly with the day or, or isn't consistent. Uh, for instance, I think um, around testing, like you had first the CDC embrace this program of test to stay in school, right? Because you, that is the objective. They've, they've now sort of come around uh, to, to say, look, we've seen the uh, impacts of keeping kids home. So we want, need to find ways to keep kids in school. And so they, the CDC endorsed this test to stay in school program. But then only a couple of weeks later, um, when they adjusted their, their guidance on, on isolation, brought it down from 10 days to five in large part because Omicron was so transmissible and it was going to have an impact on the, the workforce. Um, you had Dr. Walensky say, well, we're not going to include a testing component because we don't actually know if those tests work. Uh, the, the rapid tests are not FDA authorized to uh, gauge transmissibility. And the rapid test or the, uh, the PCR test, you can test positive for, you know, I forget what it is, three months or something. Uh, so we're not going to use a testing component. So you have sort of, you know, they're, they're encouraging testing in order for kids to stay in school, but in, in a different section of their guidance saying, uh, actually the tests don't matter to a skeptic that's problematic so and and that is sort of the thing that that fox will seize on when you're covering an administration and uh, i think also a lot of any network their job is to any reporter really covering this white house your job is to you know hold people to account and if there's something that's inconsistent uh that's going to be part of the discussion I think that if the um, CDC can do a better job of sort of communicating to people like this is where we're at, it's going to change. Um, you know, we had we learned a lesson with Omicron. Maybe we didn't see it coming or here are the lessons we learned from this. Here is our, our new guidance. Bear in mind, people, that this could change. I think most reasonable people um, think <laughs> to themselves like, OK, wh what's what's the guidance? How long do you think I'm going to have to follow this guidance? Uh, what does my future look like? And, you know, how, how do I get back to a state of normal that's manageable? I think, that, I think that's what most people, you know, want to hear. And you've had coverage is sort of all over the place because you are in a, a very partisan political environment where, you know, you had people who... Uh, early on in the pandemic, we're downplaying the severity of, of things. I mean, I was in New York City when it was the epicenter. I lived across from a funeral home. Like, I heard nothing but sirens for months when, when the campaign trail got shut down and I was home in my apartment. I, I, I lived that. Like, it, it's real. And so I even had conversations with people who were like, oh, it's not, it's not a real thing. I'm like, hello, people are dying. Um, but I, I think that a lot of, you know, what you see in the media has to be coming from the top. Like, we are not... We should not be uh, shaping the narrative in the media. We should be a reflection of what our leaders are saying. So I think it's important for them to get their messaging right, and then everything else will follow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dan. Um, I, I guess just to follow up, Jackie, you're on the hard news side. I think Dr. Dan's question is, how are you able to get through to these viewers when you're reporting something like this pandemic is serious and vaccines are serious when the most watched show on the channel has Alex Berenson on telling people that vaccines are going to kill people. Is it possible to break through that and reach these viewers? Is it more difficult? What can you do to kind of combat that? I mean, I think that, and this may sound like a non-answer, but my, my objective is the same 
no matter what is playing around me. I mean, my job is to, you know, put forward the facts, whether that be case numbers, deaths, uh, where you can find vaccines. I mean, I work that into every interview. I also anchor for the, the channel. And when I do interviews on the weekends, um, I work in, you know, here's where you can find information about vaccines. I think that it's important. People who are, who want to hear about COVID want to know about the resources that are available to them. That's important to work into your coverage. And I, I think that that needs to be done every single day, no matter what is happening elsewhere in the media, because my, responsibility as a journalist doesn't change really. I mean, my, my job remains the same. It is to put forward facts and put forward data and ask people, you know, when appropriate, Hey, does, why is this this way? Or should you be making an adjustment here? Because there is some, you know, conflict in, you know, what you're saying. Uh, for instance, recently I was asking about, you know, why did the, um, why did the FDA, you know, move away from using its uh, panel of outside advisors when it comes to recommendations on boosters? They ha- they consulted a panel of outside advisors on the vaccines themselves, but they didn't for the boosters. Why is that? Um, and you will, you know, those are fair questions to ask. And I think that people, you know, who, who want to consume information and get to the facts and, and make their own decisions can use that information and, and hopefully make decisions that are healthy for them and for people around them. Um, but, you know, my job is the same no matter what. Did you get an answer or did they not answer? They didn't. They did okay. not answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not that's – that's uh, that, and, and we don't mean to hold your feet to the fire here. It's just really great to get into your thinking about how you do your job. So we will go uh, to Ethan for our last question. Ethan, over to you. Jackie, this is so illuminating and brilliant. And as a fellow New Englander, uh, wicked great to hear from you. Um, (laughs) So I'm interested in kind of the polarization conversation and where you see your role in elevating stories that are not necessarily supportive to our nation's polarization and how many, how you get to choose if you have that kind of power at this point to two stories that are shifting the narrative or focusing on, you know, the, the spaces where we converge. And obviously you're speaking to kind of the history of the Biden administration and Biden's history and kind of being bi- a bipartisan dude. Um, but curious to hear kind of, yeah, what, what, what role you think you can play or do play in telling, choosing stories that are a bit more elevating towards unity? Well, I'll just be completely honest with you. I mean, I had a lot more of an ability to like pitch story ideas when I was not covering the White House because the White House is just its own beast. I mean, you're you're covering whatever is happening that day, whatever the president is doing. Um, it's it sort of is a self driving machine. So if the president is focusing on those kinds of stories or those kinds of issues, then that gets worked back into the media. Um, Or if there are, you know, prominent voices who are making a racket and saying we want answers from this president on these issues, then that's another way for it to get into to my coverage. But um, I I just have to be honest, like I can't wake up tomorrow and be like, you know what, I think that we should do a story on X, Y, Z tomorrow um, because there's only two of us. It's me and it's me and Peter Ducey covering the White House. It's a giant beat to cover. And there's always news of the day that has to be reported. And that consumes, you know, the, the majority of our time. Um, but I, I do think, you know, when that is the focus of the White House, that is also our focus. So when voting rights was, you know, a major focus of the White House, that's what we covered all week when it, when it was BBB, when it was infrastructure, uh, same thing. So we're very news of day driven. Um, but if, you know, if the objective is to get to unity, I guess it would be to get the president or to get the president to talk about it or to get prominent voices uh, that the president, you know, calling on the president uh, to to do those things. And then then it works its way into the coverage. What message do you want to leave people with? It can be about news. It could be about your career. It could be about the state of the country, whatever. It could be about Fox, could be positive, negative, or somewhere in between. I guess what I would say is that, you know, it has been, it's a, it's a polarizing time, right? And people, 
people are mean on the internet. People are mean on Twitter. Um, people think that they know everything about you. Um, and you know, have snap judgments. I think that it's important to remember that people are human. Um, like, and I'm not speaking necessarily for myself, but I think that generally speaking, you know, it's easy to have, uh, incorrect views or of, of your neighbor. If you don't talk to your neighbor, I think that, you know, just because of social media and how much time we spend on our devices, we spend less time talking to people in person and figuring out sort of the, the depth of their their perspective on an issue. I don't want to say that social media is bad. I also think that it brings people together. I also think it's a great space to to share ideas, but it, it runs the risk of like having people, you know, not not engage in in real conversation with folks anymore. So I appreciate this kind of a forum where you, there's an opportunity for a long form discussion. Um, and I'd like to have more of that. It, you know, if people can bring that to their everyday life then I think it would be a a better place. That's all we have for you today. Huge thanks to Jackie and Fox News, to our listeners for their questions, and to you for being here. As a quick reminder, all of our events are taped 100% live. Anyone who wants to can join to ask a question. We welcome voices from across the political spectrum. The one rule is to keep it civil. For information on how to join us, past episodes, or to sign up for our best of newsletter, please visit our website, pm101.live, where you can find all that and more. Our next episode this Friday will feature Josh Barrow, host of the Very Serious Podcast and former senior editor of Business Insider. If you like what you hear, please take two seconds to subscribe, leave us a rating. It's a huge help as our community grows. If you subscribe, that will also ensure you don't miss Friday with Josh. This has been Politics and Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon. 